meeting. Okay, thank you. James, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. It's uh, 6 04, and we're going to call the meeting to order for our Citizens Advisory, Citizen Climate Advisory Committee meeting, um, March the 28th. Uh, attendance, uh, Steve, would you record our attendance, please? Uh, uh, James, I'm sorry, James. Yes, I uh, will record that. Okay. I'm asking uh, if we we don't have to uh, vote on it, but uh, has everyone had a chance to look at the agenda? Yes. Yes. Okay. Are right. any uh, changes to the agenda? No. Okay. Hearing none, we're going to go ahead and uh, accept the agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. Reviewing our February 21st meeting uh, minutes. Uh, if everyone had a chance to look at it, any, any suggestions, any changes, corrections? All right, hearing none, seeing none, uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, accept those. Okay, moving to uh, the fourth item on our agenda tonight is, uh, is our uh, guest speaker, uh, is our consultant for the ICEI, uh, Matthew Cates. Hi, hi, Matt. Hello, thank you for having me. You're welcome, thank you for coming. Um, we can go ahead and uh, let you introduce yourself and then tell us what you're, uh, what, what you're gonna do for us on that report. Sounds good. Well, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you all. I see some familiar faces, um, so it's good to see you. Um, I'm Matthew Katz, a program officer at ICLEI USA. Um, I'm going to be presenting the results of the Alachua County greenhouse gas inventories. So we did a community-wide greenhouse gas inventory as well as a local government operations inventory. Um, so I'll be presenting those as well as discussing uh, a few things related to ICLEI um, as well as next steps. Um, so yeah. Okay. Welcome. We look Thank forward you. to it. Uh, okay. At this time, um, uh, Matt, you can go ahead and start your report. Awesome. All right. I will share my screen. Go ahead and try that. If you, if you have any trouble, just let me know. All right. I think I can. All right, I'm going to switch to view my monitor. So if I'm looking away, my apologies. Can everyone see my screen all right? Yes. yes. All right. Well, like I said, um, I'm going to be presenting on Alachua County's uh, inventory results and next steps for, for both the community-wide and government operations inventory. Um, I um, want to give a, view, uh, a bit of a background on ICLEI. Um, if any of you were present for the Gainesville report that I did or the presentation, then this may be a little bit repetitive, but I do want to make sure any newcomers um, do understand what ICLEI is, who we are, what we represent. Um, we are a um, global network um, working with more than 2,500 regional and local governments across the country or across the world. Um, we are active in 125 countries. Um, and um, within the United States, we um, represent a very large portion of the country. Um, we like to, um, we, we support um, sustainability policy and drive local action with the various pathways that you see um, listed below. So we support the decarbonization pathway, which we'll be talking about today, but we also support a variety of others such as circular economy, um, equity, community resilience, and our nature and health pathway. Um, so as I mentioned, um, our USA network is one of the biggest in um, ICLEI in the worldwide um, in the worldwide network. But for the United States specifically, we have over 325 members across the country in over 45 in, in 45 states. Um, within Florida, we do have um, Florida is one of our largest um, um, states for our network. Um, but again, we uh, our, our network spans across the country. Um, so we're you know certainly expanding uh, month by month, but um, yeah, we, we do represent all corners of the country. Um, our membership um, not only includes counties and local governments, but also 
sovereign nations, um, educational and cultural institutions, and then also regional governments. Um, I think I mentioned that, but you know, we do have a lot of regional governments as well. Um, this is one of our frameworks, our, our main framework that we've been using. Um, really, it's to describe the integrated climate action planning process, really from committing to an action all the way to analysis and accelerating and advocating for a certain process or plan. Um, for the low emissions pathway, um, the, which we're working on right now, which we've supported Alachua County and also Gainesville for, um, you know, we just did the analyze phase, which we, again, are supporting the inventory work for. Um, and then as you fo go forward and move on from the, the analyzing phase, you would be developing an integrated climate action plan, which is in the act phase. And then you'd be accelerating towards um, implementation as well as monitoring impacts and reporting on those impacts. Um, so again, these are a representation of our tools for the low emissions pathway. Um, we have the inventory, um, forecasting and planning, um, monitoring and tracking, um, and then reporting. So again, this is all um, part of the process, um, building up to a climate action plan all the way to um, those um, following the, the approach after a climate action plan. Um, and I'll get into some of this a little later on in terms of next steps. Um, a quick mention of how we support our, our members. Um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback just in, just in case um, anyone else is, if you do want to mute. But just to describe how uh, we are supporting our members, um, we provide a variety of guidance and resources, um, you know, depending on what the, the community is looking for, what step in the climate action planning process or sustainability journey um, they're in. Um, we provide, you know, expert reviews, um, quality control checks of a variety of reports and processes. Um, we provide technical one-on-one trainings um, and, and technical one-on-one -on -one calls this variety, um, and a variety of other things. Um, this, um, just for your information, the, the work we did here with Alachua County was what we would call a fee-for-service opportunity, a fee-for-service contract where you know, the, the county is paying us to do work on their behalf. Um, so getting into the specifics, the results of the community-wide inventory. Um, for those who do not know, this inventory was built on the GPC basic protocol. Um, the global protocol for cities is, a, is another way to phrase that. Um, be, um, the GPC is the baseline for this inventory, but there are other additional sectors included such as industrial process emissions. Um, other sectors like forestry um, are, are marked as information only in this inventory. So emissions and removals from, from forestry and in, in land um, are not depicted here. Um, but they are in the inventory, just again, as information only. Um, so what each sector represents is, is rather straightforward. The energy sectors are again, um, stationary combustion and electricity usage within those sectors, residential, commercial, and industrial. Um, transportation covers all the different types of transportation. Um, I believe most, if not all this is scope one, so inside the boundary. So this would be on-road transportation, all the passenger and freight cars on the road, or freight vehicles on the road, uh, public transit, um, aviation, off-road, and then freight rail. Um, we also have a solid waste sector, which covers the waste generation, um, the composting, and the landfill gas flaring. We have a wastewater and water sector, which is the emissions from wastewater treatment, as well as um, you know septic tank systems and things like that. Um, we also have a process in fugitive emissions tab, which is um, covers uh, fugitive emissions from natural gas distribution, as well as process emissions from any type of industrial facility. Um, so just to kind of go over this at a high level, electricity usage was the largest source of emissions. 34% um, of all emissions were from electricity usage. Um, mobile combustion, so really that on-road transportation is the second largest source, which with also around 34%. So those are the dominating sector, dominating activities, electricity and mobile combustion. Um, we also have stationary fuel combustion, which was only 4%. Um, I do wanna note here that you'll see that um, Argo Cement LLC, the, the, the cement production facility within the county um, represented roughly 21% of emissions. So that was around three, that was the third largest source of, of emissions. Um, looking at the community-wide pie chart, 
um, you'll see that this is a fairly normal breakdown of, of community-wide emissions. Um, this is, you know, a pretty similar breakdown to, to Gainesville. Um, you know, it, it differentiates in little by little, but again, it's generally the same, same thing. Um, you'll notice that of the 4.25 million metric tons of CO2e total, uh, just under 40% was transportation in mobile sources. Um, around 21% of these was processed and fugitive emissions. Um, again, most of those, um, most of that 21% is coming from cement production. Um, and then the industrial sector, industrial and commercial sectors are falling with 14%, um, um, sorry, residential and commercial sectors are falling with 14% for residential energy and 20% for commercial energy. Um, and then you have um, some smaller sectors such as industrial energy with 4%, um, solid waste with 2%, and then wastewater and uh, water with 0.3%. Um, so again, I would say that this is a very standard makeup of emissions um, with a community um, such as Gainesville, a lot of transportation is going on, a lot of electricity usage. So again, this, this is um, completely normal. Um, before I jump into the government operations um, breakdown, is there any questions on this pie chart or anything like that? Or do we take questions after? We, we can uh, we can take questions probably as they come up. Uh, okay. I, I, Matt, you said this is typical. Uh, is this typical with the 21%? Uh, and, and looks like commercial is larger than residential. Is that the same as would be in a in in most cities? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I say typical, um, the, the, the makeup of transportation and energy emissions does look pretty typical. I would say if you have a large industrial facility like a cement production facility, this is generally what inventories with that look like, um, a large presence of industrial emissions for sure. Um, and with um, comparing commercial and residential emissions, um, it really depends, but with the with the presence of University of Florida um, and other commercial entities, I would say that this is a pretty um, this is pretty typical to have electric to have commercial electricity dominating um, other sectors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I will say um, for most inventories, um, you know, you have transportation emissions hovering around um, a third of all emissions. So, you know, that is pretty um, typical as you you see here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Matthew, okay. did you check whether, so you've included UF within commercial energy? Yeah, that is correct. So we didn't um, break it out. Um, however, the Duke, because Duke Energy serves University of Florida, um, their commercial data is, um, includes University of Florida. So I think that they do have their own uh, green initiative plans. So just to be good to make sure that it's not being double tallied within their own inventory. So the way, so the way community-wide inventories work, and maybe I'm not understanding your question, so certainly correct me if I'm wrong. But they're when you're looking at inventory side by side, depending on what level of jurisdiction, there would be double counting of emissions such as when you're looking at Gainesville and electoral counties inventories next to each other. But that doesn't go to say that, you know, there are certainly emissions that are, um, there, there, are there are emissions that are certainly unique to both inventories, but also emissions that, that, are, um, that are intersected. Hmm. Um, and I'll actually show you some comparisons to Gainesville um, in a couple of slides. Okay. So moving on to government operations inventory. Um, so this inventory was built upon ICLEI's local government operations protocol. Um, so ICLEI, along with a variety of stakeholders from other organizations, um, universities, et cetera, um, a couple, I would say maybe more than 10 years ago at this point, have developed a local government operations protocol. It still is today the standard protocol for government operations. Um, so what this really represents, um, um, almost 100% of these emissions are owned and operated by the by the Electoral County government. Um, 
we do collect all we do collect data on all of the um, activities, facilities, et cetera, that Electric County owns and operates. However, um, some of this inventory does include activities, sources, et cetera, that um, the, the county doesn't um, quote unquote own or operate. Um, what I mean by that, a, a solid example of that is employee commute. So the government doesn't own and operate that activity. However, they have an influence over that activity. So we do include them in a government operations uh, inventory. Um, so just to kind of run down the, the sectors, we have buildings and facilities. Um, buildings and facilities, again, is just the electricity and stationary fuel usage of those buildings and facilities all owned by Lachew County. We have the vehicle fleet. Um, this vehicle fleet, again, is all on-road and off-road fleet vehicles owned by the county. We have employee commute. So again, this is estimating the amount of emissions um, coming from um, the travel of employees to and from their residences and, and to and from work. Um, we have solid waste, which is an estimate of waste generation. Um, this is not, um, this is what we would call a scope three emission because this is just emissions from the generation of government operations um, waste generation. Um, this is not a landfill owned by the county because they don't own a landfill. Again, this is just coming from the government waste generation. Um, similarly, for water and wastewater, this is not um, emissions from a, um, a government owned operation. This is rather just emissions coming from the generation of that water and wastewater. Um, so the treatment emissions coming from that generation. And last but not least, uh, we have process of fugitive emissions. So again, this would be the fugitive emissions coming from natural gas distribution. So when I say natural gas distribution, it's that pipeline natural gas, and there's always a little bit that is leaking from that, that distribution pipeline. So we do wanna calculate that when we can. Um, so the total emissions for government operations was just under 20,000 metric tons. Um, for those who don't know, the government operations is only a small subset of community-wide emissions. Um, so really it's, um, you know, all of these emissions um, would be counted in the community-wide inventory when, when, you're, when you're looking at the whole thing. But again, we're really just for right now focusing on government operations to see, um, you know, what sectors are producing the most emissions. Um, so looking at buildings and facilities, um, buildings and facilities, light, um, sorry, buildings and facilities, electricity consumption was the largest source of emissions with approximately 42% of all emissions. Um, vehicle fleet was the second largest source of emissions with around 25%. Um, employee commute was the third largest source of emissions with around 20%. And then building fuel combustion was the fourth largest source of emissions with around 11%. So again, um, looking at this pie chart, you'll see that buildings and facilities was around 50% of all emissions because you're adding up that electricity and fuel combustion together. And then again, you have the employee commute, which was around 20% and the vehicle fleet, which is around 25%. Um, the other sector is really just make up just a sliver of, of all emissions. Um, I would say, again, this is a very normal looking government operations inventory. Um, buildings and facilities are, are most often the dominating sector followed by fleet and commute. Um, this is especially true because the county doesn't own a significant water or wastewater or a, a solid waste operation or facility. So when you don't own either of those, most of the time, um, the three that you see here are, are going to be dominating in emissions. Um, so that's really it for the pie chart. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but I will move on to the comparison of Gainesville. Um, I did do a comparison of Gainesville because we do have some of their data um, and I did share it with this committee and I believe other participants um, last, last time I presented. Um, I do want to mention that, um, or I rather, I, I prefer for you all to keep in mind that the Gainesville activity and emissions that are counted here are also included in Alachua County's inventory. Um, so the green bars really are a subset of the orange bars as well. Um, these inventories um, utilize the same accounting methodologies as much as possible. However, sometimes we had to um, we had to veer away from from some of the accounting methodologies, such as um, uh, the best example of this is when um, 
some of the electricity providers for the county did not provide data. Um, so we had to estimate some of that electricity consumption. Um, so I do want to just, again, show you electricity. Um, this was this is, again, it's pretty normal of a breakdown, especially with the presence of Gainesville. Um, electricity for, for um, Alachua County was around 2.2 times higher. Um, for commercial, it was around one and a half times higher. And then industrial, it was just over um, the same. So it was around 1.1 times higher. Um, and for natural gas, it was around 1.9 times higher for, for residential, um, 1.4 times higher for commercial. And it was the same for industrial, um, for natural gas again. Um, looking at this, it really shows you that the, the industrial presence in the county is really focused in, in Gainesville. Um, it also shows you, you know, that, that the commercial presence is also predominantly in Gainesville. Obviously, there's some in, in other parts of the, of the county, but again, still predominantly in Gainesville. So just to be, make sure I'm, I'm, I'm up to speed. Um, so basically the difference between the two would be the, those contributed by the county, including the, the outlying towns like Archer or, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the difference between the, the green and, and orange bars would be any, for example, for residential, it would be any other type of residential facility uh, or residential um, building in another city outside of Gainesville, um, but that's also bounded within the county. Um, for commercial, again, it could be in another city, but, but within the county boundary. Um, Looking at VMT, which is vehicle miles traveled. So this is a measurement of, of on-road transportation activity. Um, Electro County was approximately 2.4 times larger. So you can see that, you know, there's a lot of travel, um, you know, outside the county um, or sorry, outside of the city of Gainesville as well. Um, so we certainly want to focus on these when it comes time to, to climate action planning. I will say um, for both of the um, VMTs, the Gainesville and the county, we did use Google Environmental Insight Explorer, which is a location-based, um, it's a location-based measurement. It's a, a measurement based on continuous activity. Um, so um, we believe here at ICLEI that is one of the best sources of, of free data. Um, and our members use it all, all the time to, to track um, local VMT. Um, so again, what you're really looking at is, is Alachua County having around 2.4 times the, the, the VMT of Gainesville. Um, for solid waste tonnage, again, this is, this is, um, this is strictly solid waste. Um, this is um, approximately Gainesville, or sorry, Alachua County is approximately 1.3 times higher in solid waste. So showing this, um, you know, really Gainesville does make up a considerable amount of that solid waste tonnage within the county. Um, I do want to mention, you know, VMT is in billions. Um, I, I know that doesn't, you know, doesn't give much context, but just note that that is, you know, 2.5. You, you see there, those are, those are billions. Um, and for solid waste tonnage, that's in thousands. So, um, you know, Electro County was just under 200,000 um, um, tons of, of solid waste. Um, I do see a question, I wanna make sure. Yeah, hi Matthew. I was going to ask a question on VMT. Yeah, I'm just curious why you chose to use that tool instead of, say, uh, fuel purchased in the county. I don't know the accessibility of that data, but yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So, fuel purchase for the county, um, and um, we don't often use fuel purchase for the county. Mm -hmm. um, VMT is 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 often directly proportional um, with with county activity um, because well. I guess to, to break down fuel consumption, um, often fuel consumption, if it's if if you can get data on fuel consumption within the county boundary, it's not it doesn't directly correspond with the activity in the county. You could purchase it in the county and then leave directly and then use all that fuel somewhere else. But then mm -hmm. you know it's just very difficult to estimate how much of that fuel is being consumed in the county. Um, with VMT modeling. Um, it's a lot, you, again, you have a lot better um, of an estimate of how much activity is, is actually happening in the county, um, especially with Google EIE. Again, it's a location-based um, continuous measurement of activity. So as someone is, 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 is driving, um, you know, we, we can better understand um, how much, you know, 
uh, VMT is, is um, occurring in a day in a, in a year. Um, this allows the county, allows cities all over the United States to better, again, track VMT and then make plans to reduce that VMT. Um, so really, um, at a high level, VMT is just a lot better to use when you're climate action planning um, mm. because you, you can address VMT through land use planning and through um, you know, mode shift planning. Um, but it's a lot more difficult to, to um, address fuel consumption head on um, because it's, it's often difficult to, to, to address um, relationships with gas station, things like that. Sure. Okay. No, I think that's a tool I'll have to dive into. It's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on the inventory report, we do um, mention um, the Google EIA tool. Certainly look into it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great tool. And a lot of our, our members... Um, across the country are, are adopting it more and more. Um, all right, so key takeaways here um, for the community-wide inventory. Again, I've gone over the percentages, but just as a reminder, electricity usage is the largest source of emissions with around 34% of all emissions. Um, there are just a lot of, of opportunities, um, economic, climate, social opportunities um, to, to um, to improve, or there are a lot of opportunities to, to improve the county um, through um, energy efficiency, grid decarbonization, renewable procurement, um, you name it. Um, a lot of these um, opportunities come from the partnership, um, or I guess a close engagement with Gainesville, as well as a close engagement with GRU. So, um, you know, we certainly think that pursuing energy efficiency, grid decarbonization, and renewable, renewable procurement at the local level um, will certainly address emissions, but also improve and provide social benefits throughout the county. Um, for mobile combustion, again, this is mainly on road transportation. This also is, is around 34% of emissions. Um, Alachua County really does have an excellent opportunity to leverage community-wide vehicle electrification, um, as well as mode shift. Um, again, since Gainesville does um, own the RTS and with your close collaboration with Gainesville, you know, there is the opportunity to increase transit and to, 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 um, to pursue mode shift um, to get less personal vehicles off the road and more public transit um, on the road, as well as to reduce personal vehicle trips and increase biking, walking trips, et cetera. Um, as I just mentioned, again there, again, there is a great potential for renewable energy, whether it's on the grid or distributed renewable energy, and that really does come from the close collaboration um, with GRU and Gainesville. You know, their, their efforts, there are a lot of great efforts being made, um, but with the collaboration of all three entities, the county, the city, and, and the, the utility, certainly could be great um, benefits there. Um, and then the, again, the geography of, of Florida. Um, I will say a lot of our members who wanna pursue, um, um, you know, ambitious solar goals are trying, but you know, the solar potential in, their, in a lot of the states are not, um, as great as they are in Florida. So, you know, a lot of Florida communities are, have unique opportunities to really harness the power of solar and, and really pursue distributed solar. Um, also, we don't want to leave out the, the, the opportunity for recycling composting programs to remove um, the greenhouse gas emitting waste types from your waste stream. Um, this is only 2% of your inventory, but again, to get to, to get to ambitious goals of zero by 2050, for example, you really do need to start, um, you know, addressing solid waste emissions. Um, and also again, have, have notes here saying, you know, cement production again is 21%. Um, so, you know, the, this is something to consider as well as stationary combustion is 4%. Um, you know, there, there are certainly ways to address this like um, electrification, things like that. Um, I would say lastly, 3% um, of emissions is off-road mobile sources. Um, so, you know, can certainly um, dive into that at a later date, but off-road mobile sources of things like lawn mowers, um, construction vehicles, things like that. So this is something to, to address as well. Um, let's see, um, I see a question in the chat. Um, okay, let's see. Well, we'll, we'll move on and, and let them ask the question. Um, so for government operations, it's, it's a very similar approach. Um, building electricity consumption is the um, largest source of emissions, 42%. Um, it's, a, it's the same thing again with, with grid decarbonization and renewable procurement, um, energy efficiency, all of the above. Um, those emissions can be greatly reduced. 
Um, vehicle fleet is the second largest uh, with 25%. Um, and there's a great opportunity to not only electrify the vehicle fleet, but also for, for an audit of the fleet operations. Um, oftentimes, a lot of our local government members um, do audit their fleet operations even before they, they try to electrify, fully electrify or partly electrify their fleet. And they do see that there is a lot of waste of, of either um, waste in mileage, um, waste that they have their cars laying around that they don't need. Um, so, you know, auditing fleet operations is certainly a good way to reduce those emissions, um, you know, early on. Um, employee commute, again, is the second largest source of emissions, 20%. And this is a great opportunity to, to reduce emissions through, you know, work from home um, or hybrid working options. Um, you know, other types of transit programs incentivizing walking and biking. Um, now more than ever, we've seen that, you know, um, working from home is, is extremely easy with Zoom and other types of, of, um, of, of technologies. Um, you know, we can, we can greatly reduce employee commute emissions. Um, building fuel consumption is the fourth largest um, and that's 11%. And really the only way to reduce um, building fuel combustion is to just fully electrify buildings. Um, so that those certainly need to be addressed head on to, to, um, to reduce, really to reduce those emissions. Um, and then the same thing again, um, there, you know, with, with renewable energy and electrification, energy efficiency, et cetera, um, you wouldn't see enhanced greenhouse gas reduction. Um, so next steps, um, Tom, if you want to ask your question or you can certainly just send me a chat about vehicle electrification, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, um, or did you want me to ask it now or later? Oh, go ahead. All right. Um, I'm, I'm asking for my own education. I don't have a point of view here. Um, basically, when you shift to electrical via, via vacation, you're shifting the you're shifting the pollution from one to the other. It, does that mean it'd be more efficient at the power plant for them to deal with it? Because you still have to generate that energy. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm all for EV vehicles. I'm just saying somebody posed the question to me and I wasn't fully educated enough to be able to respond to that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, it, it first and foremost, um, you know, you are right. The the um, the demand for electricity um, there there would be an increased demand from electricity um, as more and more EVs are being adopted. Um, that would obviously you know more generation would need to happen. Um, I will say um, the the when you're looking at, for example, a unit uh, when you're looking at um, the amount of emissions per mile for um, a gas or a diesel car um, compared to you know the equivalent of an EV um, when that when that electricity is being generated plant, um, that EV emissions are less, especially as you improve the efficiency and um, of that of that power plant, and as well as you obviously decarbonize that power plant. So the whole goal would be to um, have more electricity consumption for from vehicles and from heating systems, as well as decarbonizing a power plant, so that the more energy you consume still the less emissions coming from all those sources. Um, I will say, um, you know, to be totally transparent, there are parts of the country, um, I, you know, you'd have to look it up, that I'm sure, or, or, or at least parts of the world, um, but I believe parts of the country, where I'm sure it would be more, um, um, it would be more polluting to have an EV than to have a gas car. And that's just because you might be in part of, and I know Florida is not one of those places, but you might be in a in a grid region where most, if not all, of your electricity is being produced by coal, and at that point, you know that might be a very specific example of when it might not be in your best, um, it might not be the best case to switch to EV yet. Um, but again, the key word there is is decarbonizing the grid. So as soon as those types of power plants start decarbonizing, as soon as you know the the grid becomes starts to become fully decarbonized, that's when, you know, those emissions would, would slowly become to zero. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, if you have any more questions, I'd be happy to, to follow up with you um, or ask them here, happy to answer them. Hey, Matthew. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm gonna jump in again. Um, I know this is 2019 data. Um, and so does it have data on if work from home is actually more uh, less energy intensive 
than working in the office because I think now there are conflicting studies coming out. Are you referring to in terms of like uh, the electricity consumption from everyone working in their homes versus electricity consumption from working in a centralized office setting? X, X Y, and Z factors. Um, but it's just showing that it's not, it's not as clear now that it is less energy intensive given yeah. the energy use is one, but. Yeah, I would certainly be interested in looking at those. Um, and I, I can follow up with you on those. I mean, you know, first off, one on one, the employee commute emissions would obviously just decrease because there wouldn't be commuting if everyone was working from that's, that's the obvious. Um, I will say I um, am not familiar, um, but it certainly would, would be, um, would be, would want to read anything that says that um, there would be a adverse effect of having people um, yeah. working from home. Um, I would say with the the current um, work from home movement, I mean, just in my personal opinion, I couldn't see there being much more of an increase in electricity consumption. Um, you know, I, I, I could be wrong though. I, I mean- yeah, my, my concern in Florida, and so maybe you change up what you do um, depending on the season, but um, you know, if you're home all day in the summer working, you're going to be running the AC all day versus you might have it turned up uh, when you're in the office. And now you've got how, how many how many employees were there? 1,200? I mean, if you've got that many households now running their AC, um, you know, full blast all day, it's a little different than if, say, if you were in an energy efficient government building and it was turned down at home. So I, I know it's not, it's, this is getting a little granular, but that's why it's not so clear, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, and with the, the increased work from home options, um, I assume there's going to be certainly a lot more um, research diving into this. I mean, you do bring up a good point, the, the peak of, of um, AC demand for sure. Um, yeah, I, I really don't know. It's a great question. Um, I would say ultimately, as everything shifts towards more decarbonized grid, um, obviously, then, you know, we would certainly see just like benefits all around. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Man. That's that, yeah, that's a great question. Though I, I certainly would um, add that to my my list of of research to look for. Hey, um, Matt, I have a question as well. Yeah, in terms of electric vehicles and you know making that switch electrification of of vehicles is it taking into account. Um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with battery manufacturing and, and end of life management? Yeah, it's also a great question. So those are what we would call upstream emissions. Um, so there's a variety of ways you can frame those. So upstream emissions, um, the reason why they're called upstream is obviously because those are, you know, upstream. Um, we can also call them scope three emissions because they're not in the operating boundary or the community wide boundary of Alachua County. Um, we, the, the, per the protocol that we built this on, um, we do not include those. Um, really, to my knowledge, um, no protocol, no um, sector-based protocol would account for those. Um, and that's because there's, there's two differences. There's a difference between the protocols. Um, what you are looking for is really a consumption-based emissions inventory which is an inventory that accounts for um, the emissions that go into any of the goods and services that, that a, a resident or business is using. Um, so it would consider any of the emissions that a gas or battery powered car, um, um, the emissions that go into to building that car and shipping it, things like that. Um, I will say just to kind of, you know, just because you brought it up, um, we ICLE is producing, um, and we're currently in the process of, of building two new protocols. Um, one is called our is our Plus protocol, and it does consider upstream emissions. So that is a protocol a community would use to consider um, the emissions from from battery production for an EV. But yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good question. It's just um, yeah. My understanding is the emissions associated with those two things are not neg negligible by any stretch. So that's, yeah, that's for sure. interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I would say two things there. Um, the way sector-based um, inventories work, um, they should be working in conjunction with one another with the consumption base where sector-based, you want to worry about what you have direct control over 
and you can influence to reduce. The consumption base is again, what you have influence over, um, how you can, how the residents, the businesses, the government can reduce their consumption of goods that have, that are very uh, emissions intensive. Um, but yeah, no, you do bring up a great point. Um, I will say though, and I, I could be wrong or could have seen an outdated analysis. Maybe you've seen a, a, um, a, a more recent analysis, Justin, but I believe the the wheels um, the the wheels to well I think that's what they call it or basically the life cycle emissions of an EV um, is still less than a gas powered car when you consider the activity basically from it being produced all the way from it being in the the dump I could be wrong but I believe um, that is still the case I think Matthew's right on average there are tools. And Matthew, you can tell me if you um, if I'm if I'm wrong, but there are fleet analysis tools where you can kind of analyze which vehicles make most sense to procure for your fleet. Um, yes. And like the time frame, you need to have them in the fleet for it to make sense versus comparable um, ICE or internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, yes. So you can actually get a little more specific when you're looking for procurement, so that based on what you have, maybe you've got a bunch of energy efficient vehicles that are pretty new. It might not make sense to transition some of those right away. Um, it'll depend once you do the fleet audit. Exactly. Um, and one of the tools you're referring to is called the Drive Tool, D-R-V-E. Um, it's it's um, by it's a collaboration tool by a couple of, of partners of ours, um, friendly organizations of ours. Um, it's a great tool. Um, we'll certainly discuss that with like the internal electrical kind of staff when they're ready to address government operations fleet. Um, but yeah, it does show, um, you know, the cost cost and benefit of switching from a ICE car to an EV car. Um, I don't believe Adam, I could be wrong, um, that it shows the upstream emissions that Justin was, was discussing. I, I could be wrong, but I believe it just shows the um, cost in terms of, of what you would consider a cost such as uh, maintenance, purchasing, uh, feel things like that, um, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm not sure offhand either. So yeah, but um, yeah. Anyone, if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to interrupt. Um, but I'm going to move on to next steps. Um, so the next steps are, are rather simple at this time. You know, we've I've, I've talked to, to internal staff um, from Gainesville and Alachua County, and it seems that the that the, the the next step that that really just makes sense um, based on where where they're both at is climate action planning. Um, and ICLE does provide climate action planning support in a variety of capacities. Um, you know, all of, all of what I'm about to mention yeah, can be supported through just our membership approach, um, really just us providing technical support, guidance, toolkits, resources, all again provided by ICLE, our technical team. Um, but we also do a lot of this fee-for-service, um, a similar opportunity to what we just did for the, for the inventory. Um, but really um, what climate action planning considers is um, considers mitigation as well as adaptation. So for the mitigation approach, um, one, um, the county would wanna do an improved forecast. Um, again, this is forecasting future emissions. Um, ICLE did a basic business as usual forecast under our member benefits. So when I say member benefits, um, as a member of ICLE on an annual basis, we provide a, an assortment of benefits um, depending on where you are at in your climate and sustainability journey. Um, so again, ICLE did a basic forecast, but um, you know, they, the county would certainly want to improve on this forecast to use it for climate action planning. Um, you know, the other steps would be to identify high impact actions and for, for ICLE, for our internal staff to provide a science-based target, which is a reduction target um, based on the latest climate science, the IPCC sixth assessment. Um, a wedge analysis, which is an analysis to show the, the impacts or rather the reductions of certain types of strategies such as for the community-wide, those strategies could relate to energy efficiency approaches, um, you know, uh, EV adoption strategies, things like that. Um, really just strategies at the high level or, you know, very specific level, how they impact community emissions in the future. Um, and then internal planning, again, this would more or less relate to the climate action uh, planning process. So building, building stakeholdering, um, you know, building a, a team for this, developing the plan, things like that. Um, and then for adaptation, um, it would go hand in hand with um, climate action planning. Um, or, or, sorry, go hand in hand with the mitigation portion of climate action planning. But this would really be like a vulnerability assessment, which um, I believe the county um, 
may have taken on, or, or um, certainly can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, um, but it also would include adaptation and resilience planning. So again, adaptation and resilience planning really is um, adapting to the, the shifting climate, um, increased heat, um, things like that, um, increased um, precipitation, and then you know becoming more resilient to it. Um, so certainly, you, certainly all of our members, um, as they are either creating a climate action plan, updating one, improving one, they are considering both mitigation and adaptation. Um, and this is um, you know, the last thing I have to say. Uh, these are really just general principles for next steps. And we, we really do include these on all presentations nowadays for, for local governments. And we just want to, to make sure these are abundantly clear as you are continuing, continuing on through, through climate action planning. I mean, planning in general, which is one, it's critical to have a science-based target, which I just mentioned. Um, this science-based target, again, reflects the global need to reduce by 50%. And really, um, it, it represents you know, the community's fair share to reduce emissions. Um, planning should incorporate rapidly changing trends. Um, so again, um, you know, planning should be made in concert with rapidly changing trends around grid decarbonization, um, heat pump technologies, EV technologies. So, you know, you can have a baseline plan, but, um, you know, these, these types of technologies are rapidly changing. So you do always want to, to consider how they're changing. Um, programs should take a holistic approach, including health, resilience, equity. Um, you know, this is a given at this point, but, um, you know, any type of major decision you make, whether it's reducing, um, you know, emissions um, through EV adoption, through increased transit, through energy efficiency, whatever it may be, will always have an effect, whether it's a good or, or a bad effect on someone, they will always have an effect on the community. So you certainly want to um, include all three health, resilience, and equity into planning. Um, local government can't do it alone. Um, and the reason why we say that is because, you know, the local government ha doesn't have the, um, you know, doesn't have the, the influence that, you know, other entities do. They can certainly take on certain actions. They can certainly um, address things at the local level, but really the, the utility has a, a, a stance in this as well as the state has a stance in this and really other, other governments at different levels. So again, you know, Alachua County is at a unique uh, point in time where they can really take on climate action climate action with um, Gainesville as well as with GRU. Um, and last but not least, inventories um, do provide the foundation for informed decisions and transparency. Um, so really the question is not whether to, to um, whether or not to create an inventory, you obviously need an inventory um, to kind of show where you're at, but the, but the real question is how to efficiently um, create inventories and, and efficiently take on climate action planning. Um, you know, you, you really want to just make sure that you, um, all your efforts are proportional to the give to the county's needs and to the community's needs. Um, so yeah, from that, that is my presentation. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, any questions? Great. I, I, I thought it was really, really thorough, Matt, and uh, we'll be looking at it. And if there's anything that comes up, we, we'll get with Steve and, and get back with you. Thank you very much. No problem. Happy to be here. Um, I do see two there's questions. There's a couple of hands there. Adam? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I've been asking a bunch here. Um, but I guess one thing, um, I was wondering, uh, you know, if there are any, you know, as we're looking to decarbonize and find ways to fund these, you know, if there are financial mechanisms you recommend? Yeah, there are a lot of great uh, mechanisms. Um, you know, first and foremost, with the infrastructure um, uh, passing, there are going to be, uh, there's going to be a ton of federal funding. Um, I believe, um, and I have to, to certainly revisit this, but I believe the, some of the largest counties in the state, as well as largest communities, um, automatically get funding. Um, again, I would have to, to revisit all of the requirements, but the funding would go to renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, things like that. So, you know, they're, they're, you know, communities are certainly, um, in a unique time where there's going to be a lot of federal funding, um, for, for energy related, um, actions. Um, yeah. And I believe also, um, transportation related, um, changes as well, um, from the infrastructure plan. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. And then 
uh, one more was just since um, the concrete plant is such a large portion of our emissions, are there any recommendations there? Yeah, that's uh, definitely a difficult question to answer, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. The, it, so it, it really, that, that's, that's a pretty hyper local question. Um, and the reason why I say that is because sometimes a local government has a great relationship um, and a great opportunity to, to influence those emissions. Um, and sometimes the local government can't. Um, and it really just depends on when that plan is being phased out. So it really, again, just um, depends on how the county and, and the cities want to address the power plant or the, the cement plant. Um, if it's, you know, um, not to go too deep on it, but, you know, there are certainly jobs tied to it. Um, there are certainly, um, it, yeah, it might be one of the larger job providers in the county. Um, so yeah, it's it's quite a difficult question to answer, to be honest. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions for Matt? And and you know, uh, we might bring that question up again with uh, with GRU in the city. Uh, and, and county to see how what incentives that they might have uh, toward uh, the industrial sector. Uh, a lot of times they might have energy efficient motor plans and things like that uh, that, uh, that that go with the the commercial energy efficiency programs that might be available. Yeah, I would say um, specific to to the cement production. You know, that process, those emissions are coming from cement production, like the actual process of producing that cement. So it's not okay. directly tied to, you know, space heating or electricity. Um, it, it's really tied to those furnaces producing that cement. So that is something that the county would want to, you know, discuss um, within the climate action plan, how to address that. Um, is there a way to... Um, change that type of production? Is there a way to, to work on phasing it out? If it's a, if it's a um, required um, industry, there's you know, certainly you know, ways to, again, address it, but right. yeah. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, okay, Matt, if not, thank you so much. We appreciate it. No problem. I appreciate you all having me. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you know, certainly reach out. Um, I know Sean has my email, um, but yeah, certainly you can, you can get my point, point of contact information for him. Okay. All right. All Thank right. You. Thank you so much. All right. We're, uh, let's try to squeeze in. Uh, is, is Sue on the line? Sue Blight? Yes, I am. Okay, let's let's uh, have Sue to come in and talk to us just before we go on break, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, okay. Sue, Sue's going to give us a short video to uh, on promoting uh, community engagement and some of the events that that she has and and been promoted. I've been involved with Sue and uh, I really she's really dedicated and I I really like some of the things that she's doing. Uh, to promote uh, just community engagement toward our environment. Sue? Yes, thank you. So I am uh, bringing to you a proposal uh, that you, well, actually it's not a proposal, this part is that you are already part of our story that we're telling. It's a collaborative storytelling adventure on the road to 2030, 2050 and beyond. And uh, what's happening is I'm telling a story, my story, from the year 2050, uh, looking back through um, the years from the year 2000, and we're imagining all the way up to the year 2100. So what I'm trying to do is raise a generation of children that understands that we have a big problem and we have to make a lot of change really fast and we can do it. And so in my story, we're going to reverse global warming and celebrate the Earth's temperature coming back down by the year 2050. 
and my great grandchildren want to hear how that happened. So I tell them about how we began this storytelling adventure. It really began a couple of years ago with uh, Dennis and Kip and the Sustainable Floridians program. We had a the beginning of a community-wide climate conversation to action program. Uh, went through a year or eight months of uh, programming to reach into our community and start telling climate stories. Um, we then uh, start to look all the way back to uh, before Alachua County was founded going all the way back to the uh, Tamukoan times in the 1500s before the Spaniards came, we're going to be bringing all, not all, maybe not all, but many of the stories along the way, we're bringing them to life with kids through the Star Center Theater and telling the story about 1500 all the way through the 18 and 1900s, and then coming into the 20th century and civil rights movement and all of that, the part that I remember. So I can start telling my story about uh, how things happened during that last part of the 20th century. But we, our timeline that we have ends at 1996 because that was the year that Latro County did some visioning. I think it was just to the year 2010 and uh, so this timeline needs to be updated. And we decided let's just do the whole 21st century where we have the realization that we've got a climate emergency. And part of our story is that uh, the city of Gainesville and the Latwood County declared a climate emergency and everybody in the community tried to find out what is their part in it. So we have a little character named Pacha who has a whole program of her own. And uh, she says, let's change the climate in our homes, schools and communities. So that's the work that we're doing with the children to look at how they can uh, find the uh, inner resources to do some work in their home, schools and communities involving the youth, the adults and the elders. And the way we're doing that is through a uh, performance. We've, we're on our second series of six workshops, uh, helping uh, involve uh, other organizations. Right now we have the uh, United Nations Association and Martin Luther King Commission, uh, several other organizations involved. And so our story is that we're getting on the Global Warming Express and we're going to go full speed ahead, full steam ahead with the science, technology, engineering, the arts especially, and the mathematics. And the way we're doing that is with a musical play. And like I say, we've started uh, working with the Star Center Theater kids. Last night we had seven of them on a Zoom call and we did a little bit of the story and a workshop to give activities that can uh, be used by children, youth, adults and elders. And uh, so what we would love to do is be part of, because you are part of our story, we want to be part of your story. And we would like to help you with the community outreach and I'll show you how in just a minute. And then the uh, summer camp, uh, we're hoping with Star Center Theater and we're talking about collaborating with Camp Cuscoilla and uh, hoping that that will work out so that we can develop our storytelling further so that in the fall, we can uh, really do the kind of community-wide climate conversation, getting people really involved in taking action, making their own personal and organizational action plans. And we are uh, part of a group called Arts Cohesion and Climate out of the university's uh, College of Music. And they are planning a year round climate conversation. We're part of that. And we'll be part of a uh, conference that they're doing at Earth Day next year. So I'd like to show you the kind of 
uh, invitation we would like to put together with some of the children here in Alachua County um, who can make, this is about a two and a half minute uh, invitation that we did for Martin Luther King's World House. And uh, let me, I'll just show you the first part of this. <laughs> Welcome to the Climate Collaboratory. We're creating a blueprint for a world house. Attention, attention. It's cold red for humanity. The planet is getting way too warm. The tree of life is in danger and many species are going extinct. We must escape this climate calamity. We need a blueprint for a better future. We just happen to have one. In 2015, the United Nations adopted 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We need to win the global goals by 2030 if we're going to escape this climate calamity. By 2030? That's when I will graduate from high school. People all over the world are helping to make a better future. We want to collect stories about how they are doing that. We're looking for climate collaborators who will help young people like us Build a world that works for all, not a hundred percent of humanity, and the community of life on Earth, our home. We also want stories and songs and books and movies and a lot more stuff that will help kids like me and Rebecca understand what the blueprint is all about. We are living the story that our great grandchildren will tell many, many years from now. In January and February, we'll use the blueprint for a better future to help build Martin Luther King's World House. In his Nobel Peace Prize lecture in 1964, Dr. King said, Okay, and I'll pause it there. There's a wonderful quote about all the people of the world coming to live together as one human family. And we're adding the words of the Earth Charter one earth community with a common destiny. And so this is the way that we're uh, doing this and asking for stories. And I wanted to just show you one story that we have is with your dear friend, John Nix, who told us about how he is working on climate action. And so this was just an interview that I did with him on Zoom. We have done quite a few with some of the people in our community. And we're telling the story of how we all came together to uh, help make this world work for all. And so, like I say, it's to tell the children and involve the whole community in telling this wonderful story that we can do it. And uh, by golly, we're gonna. And so I would love to be able to make a uh, similar video uh, you know, to be determined how long it is or, or what the content is, but I would like to be able to invite people to your community engagement uh, activities that you're planning during the year so that by next Earth Day in 2023, we can have a really wonderful story to tell. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Sue. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, I, I've been involved with you over the years, and I know the dedication that you have. And I think uh, definitely by committing our youth and getting our youth involved is a way to do that. Um, we're, we're following the same model. I think we follow it with energy efficiency. And if we can get our youth involved, that's the way we get our lights turned out off. That's the way we get our, our, our better gas mileage on our cars and change the way our whole way of life. So if we did it with energy efficiency, we, we can do it with, with our environmental, saving our environment also. It's just a matter of changing the way we think and changing our, our lifestyle for the bigger picture. So uh, it starts with our youth. And uh, we'll be glad to work with you in any way that we can. And thank you for all your hard work. Thank you so much. Very exciting to see what you're doing and how we can translate that into a story so simple a child can understand and take action. Right. right.
And, and we want to make part of that story what our government is doing. Absolutely. What our, what, that's very important. Uh, how, what foundation we're putting together. Yes. Uh, yes. Are there any comments or questions uh, from anyone to, to Sue at this time? Okay. Uh, yeah, Jenison. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Sue, for your dedication. It's good to see you. And, um, you know, I know how hard you've been working on this for decades, literally. And, um, you know, I think we are at a turning point. And I just wanted to um, remind the committee and, all, you know, everyone on the call that we've had conversations. We've had so many conversations about how to actually turn the community engagement into a very inclusive and widespread engagement. And, you know, one of the ideas or paths that we're trying to take is to um, identify and help support these ambassadors who can serve as liaisons with our um, committee with the with the climate committee. And so Sue, you're a perfect example. You know, I think of people like you who are, who've been out there doing this work already. We really need to be able to amplify the goals of what we're doing in this community, you know, throughout the county and invite people in and leverage what people are already doing. I mean, I just think it's a that we need that to be able to get to the ambitious goals we have to reach for our children and for all of us. But um, so, so I just wanted to say thank you. And um, if there's, I guess I wanted to ask a question of you, you know, how can we, how can the committee help you move this forward faster and amplify the work that you're already doing? Well, I would love to see how that works. I think working with John right now and helping to uh, see what we can do with the young people and especially getting some programming through just videos like that one into the schools as part of a program to start the process of um, talking about it, first of all, and learning about it and then what can I do about it? And giving a lot of options and let people choose what they want. And what I'm most interested in is doing it through the arts because it's just that way of bringing it through you into the world. And uh, so it's very exciting to be working with the Star Center Theater, beautiful, wonderful people. And we have board members coming to our meetings and, uh, but like I say, we had seven kids for our first real meeting last night and uh, great, great stuff. It's great fun. And uh, I want to tell a wonderful story. Well, great, Sue. And, and uh, we look forward to working with you. And, and I echo uh, what Genesis says. We're, we're talking about communicating and we'd love to work through organizations that are already established in the community and doing work. And, and that's how we can just kind of get that common denominator going and, and get that, uh, that uh, whole realistic effect of a, of a team concept. So we thank you again. And, and please uh, let us know what we can do either individually or as a group. And we'll be glad to, uh, to work with you. Thank you so much. I look forward to it. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Well. Why don't we take uh, a break uh, for uh, let's let's say five to seven minutes and 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 come back. All right, thank you. Thanks, John.
Okay, I think we got everybody pretty much back. I uh, think waiting on James. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move to the uh, next item here, uh, which is a discussion of the uh, new city climate director position. Uh, I'm going to turn that over to Steve. Okay. okay. All right, let me try that again. So I've got two mics going on in Okay, is that better? We still got an echo there, Steve. And okay, is that better? Yes. Okay, unfortunately, you can't see me, but um, I'm, I'm sitting at a different computer. Let me go ahead and share a screen. So I know um, Ellen Siegel is in. Uh, Steve, you still have an echo there. Okay. Steve, I think if you turn the speakers on your personal computer on mute as well, it won't give you this the feedback. So turn off the, the mute for that computer and then also the speakers. Okay, how's that? I think that's better. Okay, thanks, James. I, I think that is working. So um, we received this document um, from the, the League of Women Voters, um, kind of li listing out recommendations for a city of Gainesville climate director. And this position currently does not exist. And I think there's been some discussion about the hope that uh, the city of Gainesville will um, create this position um, to kind of coincide with the, the efforts that the, the county is doing. And so they provided this document and I sent it out to everyone. And, um, you know, if you have any comments or suggestions uh, for the League of Cities, I think they're looking for input. Um, as well as support for, for such positions. So um, I don't know if anyone has any questions about it or, or any thoughts. I can't quite get the whole thing on the screen, but um, basically they lay out you know, what they would consider for the position, um, 57 items there, as well as additional things to consider and the type of person they would want um, to look for that could do the duties and responsibilities of a, of a climate director. So, um, you know, they sent this to the CCAC last uh, last week, and I sent it out. So I don't know if anyone has any comments or, or thoughts. Um, I know um, Ellen is in the in the audience, and um, you know, I could unmute her or attempt to do that if if you would like. Would uh, would it any would you guys like to take a few minutes to discuss this, or at this time, or you want to wait until uh, uh, Tom, as as the city liaison, uh, uh, do you have any comments on this at this time? Oh, I'm a little confused by the first one. Um, so is to be located in a general government and administratively report to the city manager rather than a separate unit as uh, such as GRU. I mean, the city is pretty much divided into either general government or GRU. If you are in general government, you wouldn't have too much authority over what GRU does. So, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, once it separates out into general government side, 
and reports to the city manager, they, they've now left GRU. Um, so I don't know what the authority would be over GRU at that point, if there was any. Okay, good point. Mm -hmm. yep. so that, all the others, great. I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna go through it line by line, but that first one's a little confusing to me. Any other comments? I just had a question. Um, maybe Tom can speak to this, or I don't know. But what is the timeline for this position? And um, I guess, where is the city at? And, and what do you foresee in terms of the timeline for like bringing this someone in this position on board? Um, I'll tell you how low I am on the totem pole. This is the first time hearing of it. So I am unable to answer any of those questions. So. Sorry. so I just had an idea. I don't know if it's even possible, but I mean, if it hasn't been widely advertised, if it hasn't been advertised yet and the whole process hasn't gone through, I wonder um, if it would be worth exploring whether someone from our committee would be able to serve on the screening or screening and or hiring committee. Um, I don't know if that's ever been done for city positions in the past, but something to maybe consider. I'm certainly sure that's something to consider. The city, as far as hiring goes, moving at a snail's pace these days. So there's plenty of time to interject into it, but those decisions would have to come down from either the city commission or city manager. Again, if it's city manager, then it's under being hired under general government. I don't believe the city manager oversees GRU in any substantial way. Right. Right. My, and, and I'll just add to what Tom said. Um, you know, this position has not been posted. And, and um, Eric, I'm probably not even created at this point. So I think there is a good opportunity to provide any input to, to the city commission, um, you know, to get any kind of suggestions we would have in terms of who might be on the panel, as well as kind of a list that we, that, um, you know, we put together here. So I think there's a possibility it could be something provided to the Joint Water and Climate Policy Board um, just to get some feedback from commissioners, particularly the city commission, as to how they feel about the suggestions and, and see maybe where they are on, on whether this position is going to be um, created and advertised. That would be my thought. Okay. I, I concur. I think it's very early in the process here. Uh, and uh, as Tom mentioned, he, he didn't even know that it was something that uh, they were considering at this time. Oh, there's lots I don't know. So don't necessarily take that as a frame of reference. But um, certainly, um, I do know for a fact, things are moving very slowly because they're just short staffed to the human resources department. So even if it, even if it was approved and created, um, it still would take quite a while. Okay. Yeah, another, I think another question, which, you know, I'm sure it's not answered, but you know, what resources would be allocated to this um, climate director, you know, and, and who environmentally, what environmental roles might fall under them? You know, what, is it a team? Is this an individual? Yeah, I think I think those are all up in the air, and those would be good questions to ask when this position or program is is created or if it's created. Yeah, and if additional folks are supporting this role, which I think, given the breadth of the role, it would need to be, then we'd need to identify that as well. Um, what that might look like. I know it'll be small, but you can't just have one work on something that's going to touch every aspect of the government. Exactly. Okay, Steve, if, if you could just maybe continue to follow up on this with us as, as well as Tom and, and maybe keep reporting to us back on, on how this is going. 
I'll do that and I'll keep collaborating with Ellen and the um, League of Women Voters as well as to um, whether they have any more suggestions and at what point they may want to provide this to the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we can move to our staff updates and uh, Steve, again, we can start with you with the uh, county update. Okay, um, just a reminder, we have the Joint Water and Climate Policy Board meeting on April 25th. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay, because I'm sitting at a different spot. Um, at that meeting, we're going to have the presentation you heard earlier. We're going to have the um, uh, uh, Matt give his greenhouse gas inventory report to them. They've heard that report on the city side as well, so it's probably a good time for them to hear both sides of the report and get give him some good feedback. Uh, we're also going to hear from the city on their vulnerability analysis work that they've been doing as well at that meeting on the 25th. Um, and we'll probably give an update um, as well on our uh, vulnerability analysis work. We got an initial um, feedback on some of the work that they've been working on as well as we did just complete, I believe, we're, we're about finished with the survey work. So that should be going out for next week or so. Um, the only other thing I had, John, maybe we'll bring this up after staff update, is we did get a request um, from, from citizens to express concern about the U.S. gas plant. And we don't have a forum today, so we can't make a motion or um, send a letter. But you know, if that we can bring that up, I think maybe after staff comment. Um, but that might be something to talk about. And, and if we, you know, if this board does want to write something or express some point of view, then we'll need to get a forum together, um, possibly at the next meeting in April or a special meeting if, if, if it needs to be done sooner than April 18th. Um, otherwise. You know, we can talk about it, we can express concerns within the group, but we can't express those concerns externally without emotion. Okay. All right. Any questions or comments for Steve? I have a question. Amanda. Uh, hi, Steve. I was wondering if um, you can give us an update on the climate action plan and maybe that should be an agenda item for next month. Um, just the process, the building up the sections, um, if there's still roles for us to play if, as far as an outline or even building up the sections. I know I'd like an update on that. Okay, and I, I know I owe you some, some uh, material from that, from the waste section of the plan. So um, you know, we've been working on the, the outline still, we got a little sidetracked with some of the work that um, Megan submitted um, at the presentation to the Joint Water and Climate Policy Board, kind of shifted directions a little bit and kind of reorganized how it was presented. So somehow we need to pull that together and figure out how we can combine what Megan presented last month um, with kind of those target issues versus the categories we had in the outline. So, um, staff needs to pull that together, and uh, I'm going to bring that up with the, the, the staff thinking planning group or climate planning group next month to see if we can pull that together um, so that we can get, we can let you all know where we are in that and how you guys can then give us feedback. So, um, man, it's not much of an update, but, but yeah, I'm kind of juggling two different approaches right now and how we can piece those together effectively. Um, without losing ground that we did initially on the original outline. Okay, thank you. So so Steve, in hearing that, you, you, do you think by the next meeting, by this April 18th meeting, would that be enough time to give an update or would you not want to put that on the agenda? Uh, that's probably, I, I can do my best, but I would probably won't be ready at that point. Um, honestly, between preparing for the um, Joint Water and Climate Policy Board on the 25th and um, my department 
budget deep dive is on the 19th as well. So the timing of getting that pulled together is pretty slim. I probably would would ask to try to bring that in May if possible. Um, just because I'll be honest, I don't think I could get that done. Actually, May would be the next meeting. Um, no, I'm sorry, April then May. So yeah, I, if you could give me about a, a month and a half or so to, to pull that together, that would that would help me out if I could work for May. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, Amanda, are you are you happy? You good? I think yes. Jenison has a question. Thanks. Yes, I see it. Jenison is next. Yes, go ahead, Jenison. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, this is actually um, uh, to Ellen's comment that she dropped in the chat about the methane plant. Um, and I'd like to move that maybe we that we include on the agenda for next month a discussion specifically about the CSAC and our capacity and willingness to, you know, put forth um, a statement or a letter if when we, we would have to have a quorum, but um, I would ask that we put that on the agenda to discuss as an issue. And then all of us, our homework would be to, you know, make sure we're up to speed on where that's headed because um, it's moving fast. And so I think that's something we'd wanna address sooner rather than later. But then in the discussion, I'd also like to have a discussion about um, how we just, uh, this will kind of set a precedent for, you know, if we release a statement on policy or any investments or decisions that are made by the city or county or any of the municipalities like do you know how do we go about doing that and in, in a way that is um productive as opposed to counterproductive yeah okay uh steve and i talked about this a little bit today okay and and i'd like uh, on what our position is as an advisory committee uh, versus the commissioners. And uh, I, I'd like Steve just to tell, tell us, tell the committee what, what he thinks about how, what kind of statements we can make. Okay, so I can, and I can give you an example, but so this committee provides recommendations and suggestions to the city and county commission through the Drink Water and Climate Policy Board. So, what you would normally do is you could do it in a form of a letter, you could do it in a statement, you could do it in a presentation, but you would bring your concern to that board and present it to them. Here's, here's the issue we have, here's why we are concerned. Here, and then you could even put, here's our recommendation of what the board should do. So you could, you could suggest that they you know, publicly express concern or even lay out options for them. And then they would decide how they want to do it. Um, give you an example for EPAC, the Environmental Protection Advisory Committee. They were concerned about um, the, the water bottling plant and um, that we had, you know, last year's nesting plant. And so they wanted to express concern. They, they originally said, look, send them a letter to the state. Well, they, they can't send a letter to the state. They had to ask our board to provide a letter to the state in opposition to the nesting water plant. So that's the approach that this board would have to do. They would express, you know, what what we support or don't support, ask the board um, or recommend that the board take some kind of action, either in a statement or in a letter to you ask, um, and, and then kind of lay out why you, you think um, the city or the county commission should it wouldn't be a tough situation where this board would directly send a letter to the U.S. It would go through the Joint Water Climate Policy Board. Okay. Are, are there any questions about that? I That's the way I understood it, too, that we would recommend to the commission and that the commission did a certain thing. Given the pace at which this is progressing, 
would it make sense to call a special session just to get this letter together and or work out our position? Uh, I'm I'm all in favor of if if there's uh, that's something that you know Steve could send out and and find out if if we're you know if we 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 can do something like that if most people are w willing and wanting to do that. Um, I mm -hmm. I'm I'm in favor of doing it. Do we need um, quorum to send up a letter? To make you that will. We, we would have to meet in person. Yeah. And you have to have at least five of you. So what I can do, I can send out a poll um, for the next two to three weeks uh, and see okay. if there's a time within that two to three week period that five people can meet. And um, if you'd like, I can try to do that. If there's certain days that you can tell me right now are, are out of the question, I can I can eliminate those. But um, I'm assuming it would be in the evening. Yeah, well. um, April fourth through sixth for me. I know I'm not available. If that helps narrow down uh, your doodle poll. Okay. All right, Steve, why don't we do that and maybe just explain the reason for and uh, and see if there's uh, enough consensus that we uh, meet to to draft a letter to the commission. Okay, I'll, I'll, we'll start there and if we have enough then we're going to meet if the information I'm getting back is it's showing we can we can create a forum, then we'll meet the next time we meet at a regular meeting and we'll discuss the letter. Okay. All right. Any, any other discussion? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Tom, any other comments from the city? No, I don't have any reports. Um Anything I would have to report is currently covered under our cone of silence related to something else. So I'm not able to report on that. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, Justin, GRU. You know, no updates right now. Can you hear me okay, John? Yes, we can. Okay, I wasn't sure if this headset's working. Um, yeah, but let me know if there's any questions you have for me that I can take back to management at GRU and answer. Uh, okay, committee, do you guys have any questions uh, for Justin or, or Tom? All right. Hearing none, we're going to uh, get to the point where we can talk about uh, suggestions for our next, uh, next regular meeting uh, items that we would like to have. We definitely talked about the uh, UF uh, plant. So that's something that we, we, we're gonna be working on. Uh, any other suggestions? Um, is there someone, I don't know who, but someone that can help us understand more, um, you know, the concrete plants role in emissions in our community and maybe if there are pathways to decarbonization there, there's someone we can at least start working with. Yeah. I just, I, I, Justin, does, does GRU have a industrial rep? Uh, how does GRU work with the country? Uh, I know they're a big energy user and uh, it, it sounded like the the way the concrete plant is as far as emissions it's it's the process that, is, that they use um typically uh you know utilities have their industrial rep that calls on that facility is do you know if uh if gru is engaged with them in in their processes very much 
I do not know specifically, John, but that is certainly something I can I can take a look into and, and figure out who would be the best person to reach out to to see if GRU is supplying. I'm I'm you know I'm just making an assumption here, but I would assume that they're primarily using natural gas in their in their production process. Um, so yeah, I can I can definitely I'll look into that. Okay, and and maybe uh, see if if. You know, if we know internally, if they can give us an idea of where that plan is in terms of marginalization. I can get a hold of the state permit for it as well and then get you, get you guys some information about, um, you know, what the permit requirements are, including air emissions. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, any other any other suggestions? I don't know how much time we have on the agenda, um, but you know, it looks like we're going to have to start looking at the fleet as well. So I don't know if there's a fleet manager that might be able to provide insights into the age of the fleet, uh, the city's processes, and you know, uh, procurement updating. Uh, just to kind of hear from them how difficult it will be to transition. Okay. If that's uh, too much, we can push that to another month, but I just throw in ideas. Okay. All right. And when you say the fleet, uh, you, you, uh, you're going to talk about the county's fleet, the city's fleet. Uh, where, where, are we, where are you thinking about uh, when you said that? Uh, I guess I'd have to pull up the study and see which was uh, I, I think they did both they did the the city and they did the county uh, um i could defer to y'all I, I didn't have a preference eventually we probably want to hear from everyone okay well well maybe that's something uh tom if you could you know find out about the fleet age and 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 also uh maybe uh steve if we can find something out about uh you know the, the fleet at, at the county at, in general yeah i can i can do that okay and i know there's a comment in the chat with reference to the city recently buying through new buses with the federal money all right would there be would there be interested any interest in having a discussion about the facilities and any energy efficiency uh, improvements that might be possible. It seems like that's a huge portion of the pie. Yeah, I can, I can respond if you like. Um, at the county level, Sean McClendon was on the meeting earlier. He would be the person that could kind of elaborate what the county's been doing. In terms of energy efficiency with the facilities. Yeah. Um, the county is looking at a new location for administrative administrative building that we're working on. Um, and that would consolidate the county, many of the county operations into a single building, which would potentially be energy efficient um, overall. So we can, you know, I don't know if you know, through, in the months ahead, we'll probably have more information on that, but that would be a good idea to bring back to the county. Okay. Yeah, Steve, is there, you know, I guess you said um, the other guy could answer, but, you know, somewhere to see what incentives there are for solar locally, be that state, be that local, um, or through, through GRU, um, energy efficiency, you know, uh, uh, carpooling, I don't know what incentives already exist to help the city become more climate friendly. Yeah, I know the G the solar side is probably more in GRU bandwidth, but we are working on um, evaluating how staff commute. And, and that could be, as you kind of mentioned a little bit, that could be a, an area where there's energy, at least carbon emission savings. I know there might be, we talked about the energy side, you know, working from home, but there definitely be a reduction of carbon emissions by less travel. And the county is evaluating that and, and really focusing on potentially keeping 
a hybrid workforce intact. Uh, we need to have to even hire a, con a consultant to help us go through that process. We wouldn't give updates on that as we move along as well. Uh, okay. I, I, uh, Justin, maybe, um, I'm, I'm not, I haven't heard recently, but it would probably be nice to know if, if GRU has what energy incentives it has, uh, programs it has right now for residential and commercial. Uh, if, if they, uh, uh update on, on their energy efficiency program. I, I, I don't know if it's changed recently, but what what uh, incentives they offer uh, both on the commercial and the industrial uh, commercial residential and industrial side. Okay, I'll look into that. Okay, and here's here's kind of one uh, that's uh, just been on my mind. I don't know if this new infrastructure bill will be funneling money to the local municip municipal, uh, but I think that's a real possibility. And I don't know if anybody's really given a thought to what, what that use is going to go towards. Uh, but it would be really interesting to start having that conversation. Um, I know a lot of it's going to be going towards, you know, like it's an infrastructure bill. So. Yeah, I think that would be great to have that conversation as well. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity here and it would be good to help prioritize those projects. All right. If anybody else, that's uh, that's a lot. So uh, I think <laughs> I think we've uh, we've put a lot out there, and uh, I think uh, based on that, the admission plan, it's it's nice to know where things are going, so we can know what where to put our our efforts. So. Uh, Thank you so much for all those those comments. It it helped us, and I think that presentation was really good. The the greenhouse gas inventory presentation allowed us to to kind of see the big picture and where we should be putting efforts. So, uh, thank thanks a lot. I think that was a a, a great presentation that uh, that we received there from Matt. All right, uh, recap. Uh, James, you want to just kind of give us some action items? <laughs> I, uh, I've been taking notes th through the entire meeting. I, I don't have any specific tasks for anybody I, uh, other than Stephen. Um, let's see. So Stephen will follow up um, on the, let's see. So, okay, let me back it up a little bit. Um, we had talked about making a special session. We're going to send out a doodle poll. Uh, Stephen will be seeing if we're available over the next two to three weeks. Um, if we do have that, uh, we're asking the uh, committee members to be knowledgeable and prepared to, to discuss uh, UF's infrastructure uh, plan with the power plant. Um, let's see. We were given, let's see, uh, Steve's also, I guess I have that. Um, I think Stephen and Justin Smith, we're going to get information about the cement uh, industry, um, trying to get an idea of who regulates that industry uh, and maybe some contact information for that. Um, I think Steven was going to follow up and get some information on who to talk to about the fleet and who might be able to inform us about that. Um, let's see. Combination. Uh, I think in May, Steven was going to give us an update on the climate action plan. So a uh, general outline of the progress that's been made and, and what room uh, we might have to make any, um, any in, have any influence or make any suggestions. Uh, let's see. And 
we had discussed, I wasn't sure we landed on this, but we had discussed, discussed with this new uh, position that um, we looked briefly at for the, uh, let's see, where's the title? The new city climate director position. Uh, we did ask if we could, somebody from the committee could serve on that hiring committee, but there wasn't, there wasn't a great sense of urgency there because it's gonna be a slow process. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything. Unless somebody else can highlight something I've forgotten. One, one other thing, uh, I'd like, uh, we had requested that maybe Justin give us an update on the energy efficiency programs that GRU had uh, on the commercial and industrial and residential side. Is, is there other things that we, that we might have not uh, mentioned? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, all right, uh, Steve, we're at the point of uh, public comment. I think I saw a question from Janice. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll um, let me try to average the top. Let me take off. Okay, Janice, you can try. Yes, I am. I there? You are. Super. Thanks so much. I so appreciate um, everybody's input and the time and expertise that you folks um, volunteer uh, for us and our community. And I really, really appreciate it. Um, I was uh, kind of disheartened. Gosh, it's probably been three or four weeks ago now that um, I read an article in the Sun that I believe it was part of the infrastructure monies that the city was planning on buying uh, 24, if I have that number correct, um, buses, all of them fossil fuel buses. Um, and this just doesn't seem like the time to uh, be buying a new fleet with uh, fossil fuel buses. And I didn't know if there would possibly be an opportunity for this group to comment on that or look into that. Okay. Janice, we, we sure can. I mean, we'll 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 uh, follow up on that, and uh, and uh, if maybe if, if Tom could uh, maybe talk to us about that next time. And I'll reach out, but I don't know how far I'll get because that's a, probably an independent. Well. RTS is their own thing too. Um, and I don't know the specifics of it. Maybe they have to buy the buses within a time frame, and the electrical buses aren't going to be available within the time frame that they have to make the purchases. But I'll look into it as best as I can. Okay. okay. Thank you, Tom. All right. Janice, is there, is there any other comments you have for us? Um, no, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for bringing that up. I, I also saw that. Um, Steve, any other public uh, comments out there? I've, I've unmuted Ellen if she has any, otherwise that would be. Aren't you, thank you so much. Am I unmuted? You are. Okay, thanks. I did. Uh, I do want to echo what Janice said. Um, really, you are truly a citizens action committee and um, appreciate it. We're flies on the wall and just so impressed with what we hear and what you're doing and how much work you do. Uh, I did want to circle all the way back to Sue Blythe. Um, I've also worked with her and her her approach is not academic in any way. Um, it's not high level but it's absolutely grassroots. So I just want to uh, support what John is saying. Uh, anything that we can do as a Citizens Climate Action Committee, when we move more into engagement, she's really a very, very excellent point person. 
and I know we had talked some about faith communities. She's a, um, a very good link into faith communities as well as the children. So I, I did want to just put that out there for the, for the minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Any other, Steve? Nope, that, that's it. All right, last chance comments from the group. Steve, any parting words? Nope, we, we made it to eight. I think we're good. <laughs> and, um, we'll, uh, I guess we'll meet again before the Joint Water and Climate Policy Board, so that should be good. That'll give us some time to even follow up and we can do it again based on our next meeting or two. So. I'll send out the poll and hopefully get that out within the next day or two. Um, if any of you know you're going to be out, please just send me an email and let me know those days you'll be out. That'll help me out as I try to pick dates. Okay, will do. All right, I want to thank everybody for your time and uh, thank you for a great meeting. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you for leading us. Thank you, John and Stephen, right. for leading thank us. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank you.